This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit www.librivox.org. The Age of Innocence, a novel by Edith Wharton. Read for LibriVox by Brenda Dane. Chapter 28 all all how'd you spell it anyhow asked the tart young lady to whom archer had pushed his wife's telegram across the brass ledge of the western union office olenska o len ska he repeated drawing back the message in order to print out the foreign syllables above may's rambling script it's an unlikely name for a new york telegraph office at least in this quarter, an unexpected voice observed. And turning around, Archer saw Lawrence Lefferts at his elbow, pulling an imperturbable mustache, and affecting not to glance at the message. Hello, Newland, I thought I'd catch you here. I've just heard of old Mrs. Mingott's stroke, and as I was on my way to the house, I saw you turning down this street and nipped after you. I suppose you've come from there. Archer nodded and pushed his telegram under the lattice. "'Very bad, eh?' Lefferts continued. "'Wiring to the family, I suppose. I gather it is bad if you're including Countess Olenska.' Archer's lips stiffened. He felt a savage impulse to dash his fist into the long, vain, handsome face at his side. "'Why?' he questioned. Lefferts, who was known to shrink from discussion— "'raised his eyebrows with an ironic grimace "'that warned the other of the watching damsel behind the lattice. "'Nothing could be worse form,' the look reminded Archer, "'than any display of temper in a public place. "'Archer had never been more indifferent to the requirements of form, "'but his impulse to do Lawrence Lefferts a physical injury was only momentary. "'The idea of bandying Ellen Olenska's name with him at such a time— and on whatsoever provocation, was unthinkable. He paid for his telegram, and the two young men went out together into the street. There, Archer, having regained his self-control, went on, Mrs. Mingott is much better. The doctor feels no anxiety whatever. And Lefferts, with profuse expressions of relief, asked him if he had heard that there were beastly bad rumors again about Beaufort. That afternoon the announcement of the Beaufort failure was in all the papers. It overshadowed the report of Mrs. Manson Mingott's stroke, and only the few who had heard of the mysterious connection between the two events thought of ascribing old Catherine's illness to anything but the accumulation of flesh and years. The whole of New York was darkened by the tale of Beaufort's dishonor. There had never— as Mr. Letterblair said, been a worse case in his memory, nor, for that matter, in the memory of the far-off Letterblair, who had given his name to the firm. The bank had continued to take in money for a whole day after its failure was inevitable. And as many of its clients belonged to one or another of the ruling clans, Beaufort's duplicity seemed doubly cynical. If Mrs. Beaufort had not taken the tone that such misfortunes, the word was her own, were the test of friendship. Compassion for her might have tempered the general indignations against her husband. As it was, and especially after the object of her nocturnal visit to Mrs. Manson Mingott had become known, her cynicism was held to exceed his, and she had not the excuse, nor her detractors the satisfaction, of pleading that she was a foreigner." It was some comfort, to those whose securities were not in jeopardy, to be able to remind themselves that Beaufort was. But, after all, if a Dallas of South Carolina took his view of the case, and glibly talked of his soon being on his feet again, the argument lost its edge, and there was nothing to do but accept this awful evidence of the indissolubility of marriage." Society must manage to get on without the Beauforts, and there was an end of it. Except, indeed, for such hapless victims of the disaster as Medora Manson, the poor old Miss Lannings, and certain other misguided ladies of good family who, if they had only listened to Mr. Henry Vanderluyden. 
The best thing the Beauforts can do, said Mrs. Archer, summing it up as if she were pronouncing a diagnosis and prescribing a course of treatment, is to go and live at Regina's little place in North Carolina. Beaufort has always kept a racing stable, and he had better breed trotting horses. I should say he had all the qualities of a successful horse dealer. Everyone agreed with her, but no one condescended to inquire what the Beauforts really meant to do. The next day Mrs. Manson Mingott was much better. She recovered her voice sufficiently to give orders that no one should mention the Beauforts to her again, and asked, when Dr. Bencombe appeared, what in the world her family meant by making such a fuss about her health. If people my age will eat chicken salad in the evening, what are they to expect? she inquired, and the doctor, having opportunely modified her dietary, the stroke was transformed into an attack of indigestion. But in spite of her firm tone, old Catherine did not wholly recover her former attitude towards life. The growing remoteness of old age, though it had not diminished her curiosity about her neighbors, had blunted her never very lively compassion for their troubles, and she seemed to have no difficulty in putting the Beaufort disaster out of her mind. But for the first time, she became absorbed in her own symptoms, and began to take a sentimental interest in certain members of her family, to whom she had hitherto been contemptuously indifferent. Mr. Welland, in particular, had the privilege of attracting her notice. Of her sons-in-law he was the one she had most consistently ignored, and all his wife's efforts to represent him as a man of forceful character and marked intellectual ability if he had only chosen, had been met with a derisive chuckle. But his eminence, as a valetudinarian, now made him an object of engrossing interest, and Mrs. Mingott issued an imperial summons to him to come and compare diets as soon as his temperature permitted. For old Catherine was now the first to recognize that one could not be too careful about temperatures. Twenty-four hours after Madame Olenska's summons, a telegram announced that she would arrive from Washington on the evening of the following day. At the Wellens, where the Newland archers chanced to be lunching, the question as to who should meet her at Jersey City was immediately raised, and the material difficulties amid which the Welland household struggled, as if it had been a frontier outpost, lent animation to the debate. It was agreed that Mrs. Welland could not possibly go to Jersey City, because she was to accompany her husband to Old Catherine's that afternoon, and the broom could not be spared since, if Mr. Welland were upset by seeing his mother-in-law for the first time after her attack, he might have to be taken home at a moment's notice. The Welland sons would, of course, be downtown. Mr. Lovell Mingott would be just hurrying back from his shooting, and the carriage engaged in meeting him, and one could not ask May, at the close of a winter afternoon, to go alone across the ferry to Jersey City, even in her own carriage. Nevertheless, it might appear inhospitable, and contrary to old Catherine's express wishes, if Madame Olenska were allowed to arrive, without any of the family being at the station to receive her. It was just like Ellen— Mrs. Welland's tired voice implied, to place the family in such a dilemma. It's always one thing after another, the poor lady grieved, in one of her rare revolts against fate. The only thing that makes me think Mama must be less well than Dr. Bencombe will admit is this morbid desire to have Ellen come at once, however inconvenient it is to meet her. The words had been thoughtless as the utterances of impatience often are, and Mr. Welland was upon them with a pounce. Augusta, he said, turning pale and laying down his fork, have you any other reason to think that Bencombe is less to be relied on than he was? Have you noticed that he has been less conscientious than usual in following up my case or your mother's? It was Mrs. Welland's turn to grow pale, as the endless consequences of her blunder unrolled themselves before her. But she managed to laugh, and take a second helping of scalloped oysters, before she said, struggling back into her old armor of cheerfulness, 
My dear, how could you imagine such a thing? I only meant that, after the decided stand Mama took about its being Ellen's duty to go back to her husband, it seems strange that she should be seized with this sudden whim to see her, when there are half a dozen other grandchildren she might have asked for. But we must never forget that Mama, in spite of her wonderful vitality, is a very old woman. Mr. Welland's brow remained clouded, and it was evident that his perturbed imagination had fastened at once on this last remark. Yes, your mother is a very old woman, and for all we know, Ben come successful with very old people. As you say, my dear, it's always one thing after another, and in another ten or fifteen years, I suppose, I shall have the pleasing duty of looking about for a new doctor. It's always better to make such a change before it's absolutely necessary. And having arrived at this Spartan decision, Mr. Welland firmly took up his fork. But all the while, Mrs. Welland began again, as she rose from the luncheon table, and led the way into the wilderness of purple satin and malachite, known as the back drawing room. I don't see how Ellen's to be got here tomorrow evening, and I do like to have things settled for at least twenty-four hours ahead. Archer turned from the fascinated contemplation of a small painting representing two cardinals carousing in an octagonal ebony frame set with medallions of onyx. Shall I fetch her? he proposed. I can easily get away from the office in time to meet the broom at the ferry, if May will send it there. His heart was beating excitedly as he spoke. Mrs. Wellen heaved a sigh of gratitude, and May, who had moved away to the window, turned to shed on him a beam of approval. "'So you see, Mama, everything will be settled twenty-four hours in advance,' she said, stooping over to kiss her mother's troubled forehead. May's broom awaited her at the door, and she was to drive Archer to Union Square, where he could pick up a Broadway car to carry him to the office. As she settled herself in her corner, she said, I didn't want to worry Mama by raising fresh obstacles, but how can you meet Ellen tomorrow and bring her back to New York when you're going to Washington? Oh, I'm not going, Archer answered. Not going? Why, what's happened? Her voice was as clear as a bell and full of wifely solicitude. The case is off. Postponed. Postponed? How odd! I saw a note this morning from Mr. Letterblair to Mama, saying that he was going to Washington tomorrow for the big patent case that he was to argue before the Supreme Court. You said it was a patent case, didn't you? Well, that's it. The whole office can't go. Letterblair decided to go this morning. Then it's not postponed, she continued, with an insistence so unlike her that he felt the blood rising to his face, as if he were blushing for her unwanted lapse from all the traditional delicacies. No, but my going is, he answered, cursing the unnecessary explanations that he had given when he had announced his intention of going to Washington, and wondering where he had read that clever liars, but that the cleverest, do not. It did not hurt him half as much to tell May an untruth as to see her trying to pretend that she had not detected him. I'm not going till later on, luckily, for the convenience of your family, he continued, taking base refuge in sarcasm. As he spoke, he felt that she was looking at him, and he turned his eyes to hers in order not to appear to be avoiding them. Their glances met for a second, and perhaps let them into each other's meanings more deeply than either cared to go. Yes, it is awfully convenient, May brightly agreed, that you should be able to meet Ellen after all. You saw how much Mama appreciated your offering to do it. Oh, I'm delighted to do it. The carriage stopped, and as he jumped out, she leaned to him and laid her hands on his. Goodbye, dearest, she said, her eyes so blue that he wondered afterwards if they had shone on him through tears. He turned and hurried away across Union Square, 
repeating to himself in a sort of inward chant, "'It's all of two hours from Jersey City to Old Catherine's. "'It's all of two hours, and it may be more.'" End of chapter 28